Corey, and I have too many tapes. Sometimes you find true, singular perfection in the imperfect. Something so flawed and misguided it becomes beautiful in a way, even if that beauty is represented by sheer, gobsmacked, jaw-dropped confusion. A rare and baffling vision that is 100% indecipherable, but made with a sort of baseline veneer of competency that lulls you into thinking that there's something, anything there. It has A-list stars, or as close to A-list as you can get. You say to yourself, Joey Pantoliano is in this. John Reese davies is in this, sure, they'll both do whatever the job they can book, but certainly someone read the script and understood it. The writer-director of this thing must have had a vision worth working toward. And yes, there's a vision, but it's one of those wild, untamed visions. A vision that cannot be contained by the temporal and formal limits of a family comedy. You see, what we have here is a bizarre piece of outsider art made by a first-generation Iranian immigrant antiques dealer with an axe to grind that sits comfortably beside films like The Room and Troll 2, even if it can't quite match the same dizzying highs as those two bad movie masterpieces. This time on Too Many Tapes, I give you 1993's direct-to-video disaster piece, Robot in the Family. A special shout out to Logan from Tachyons Plus who sent me this tape. I both thank you and blame you personally. Robot in the Family is a family comedy. It's also an adventure film. It's also a slice-of-life look at the bustling world of antiques dealing in New York City in the early 90s. It's also a movie about a sentient robot that can detect gold. It's also barely 80 minutes long if you don't count the credits. As a story, Robot and the Family is hopelessly incoherent. It wanders from idea to idea in a way that makes dream logic seem sensical. It's been said that a good screenplay connects its scenes with buts and therefores. A thing happens, but something else happens because of that. A person makes a choice, and therefore a reaction happens. It's the physics of screenwriting. Robot and the Family is an exercise in and then. We do this thing, and then we do this unrelated thing, and then we go over here, and then we're over there. And then the robot says the word gold a lot. We start on, naturally, a stunning art heist in Mecca. And then, boom, title card, Robot in the Family. There's a bunch of cheapo 90s sci-fi gizmos over a really silly and slapdash song about the titular Robot in the Family. Joey Pantoliano narrates over this with an accent that is a choice. Gold digger, oh gold digger, come to my life. Yes, I'm going to finish you and you are going to make me rich. You will bring me luck. Gold digger, you are alive. It's half an imitation of writer-director Jack Shell, half Tommy Wiseau, a pinch of Borat, and all extremely upsetting. The main conflict in this opening scene is between Joey Pants, real Pantoliano heads call him Joey Pants, and his wife, who is very upset that Joey is still working on his inventions and his robot, instead of focusing more of his time on the antique shop, which, as a central character conflict, is unique to say the very least. This is followed by a very manic Pants waking up his family to show them his new invention. Rise and shine, everyone! Joey Pants is unhinged here. I am 100% convinced he was certain nobody was ever going to see this movie, so once the check cleared, he decided to do whatever the hell he wanted in any particular scene. Whatever the most personally amusing choice would be. This presentation, which the dad is formatting like some kind of weird investor pitch, is so oddly formal, he doesn't have a family so much as he has business partners. On to the robot. The design on this thing is hideous, just truly bad. A kitchen sink of kitschiness, of costume design that's only out annoying by the voice. The horrible, horrible voice. Hi, Mommy, I'm your new home security robot. That's your sick child. I am programmed to cook, clean, and do whatever your heart desires. I vacuum, dust, walk the dog, wipe the dishes. Hi, Mikey. Hi, Johnny. Hi, Alex. Wow, that's me, Dad. Hi, Richie. Hi, Cindy. Hello, my new family. 
Imagine listening to this thing for 90 minutes. Imagine, mind you, imagine. Don't actually do it. Not unless you want to slip into an unspeakable realm from which there is no escape. We're trapped down here, you and I. Trapped between Cypher from The Matrix doing his best Borat My Wife voice and what if Jerry Lewis but robot? What, you thought that because I don't have the fog machine running that this wasn't going to be a spooky episode? Well, boys and ghouls, in Robot in the Family, the real terror is that you chose to watch this film in the first place! <laughs> yeah, okay, that's enough of that. So, this is Gold Digger. He's... in the movie? He spouts random nonsense gibberish like a toddler who has just discovered the fine art of language. He is mostly incompetent, breaks frequently, and is deeply, deeply annoying. Is he important to the plot? Not really. Is it a giant revelation that this tinkerer slash antique dealer is somehow the first guy to create sentient artificial life? Nope. Will the bad guys want to steal the robot as a part of some kind of get-rich-quick scheme? Absolutely not. Will they notice him at all? Hardly. Maybe that's one of the things that makes this a true New York movie. You see a giant metal man with a traffic light on his chest walking down the street and your first thought isn't, oh dag, sentient artificial life. It's, for the love of all that is holy, don't make eye contact with the street performer. So, why is he here? Who knows? Oh, he detects gold, by the way. Standard household robot needs, cooking, cleaning, gold detecting. We get a second MacGuffin in the form of a statue stolen from a Brooklyn warehouse, and we cut to meet our other fairly respectable actor who's slumming it in the family robot comedy, John Rhys Davies, who's playing our villain. That's right, Gimli himself, Sala even, that guy from Sliders. Fourth thing. Look, Davies is a name, but of the high-profile actors here, he fits in the most, honestly. He's no stranger to trash. He's the type of actor who will take seemingly any job, and I can't blame him for that. Lots of things I could blame him for, but not that. Dude's gotta eat. John Reese davies is playing Joey Pantoliano's business and personal rival. He has a house right next to Pants. He has his business, also an antique shop, right next to him as well. But get this, apparently he's a crook. Writer-director Jack Shell allegedly based this guy off his actual business rival, who he thought was a fraud. On an unrelated note, almost 20 years later, Shao would be fined over a million dollars for selling forged art. We also meet some thugs named Bono and Clyde who keep popping up and ostensibly work for John Reese davies but they have such a thin connection to whatever plot this film has that they're almost not worth mentioning. What is worth mentioning, though, is the overabundance of racial stereotypes in this movie. It's like a hack stand-up comic from the 80s punched this thing up, or more accurately, punched it down. When in doubt, Shallow makes wild swings of whatever ethnic group he can think of. It's another way this film is sort of quintessentially NYC in the 80s and 90s. It's a grand melting pot of people being horrifically insensitive to each other. Pants' solar-powered car breaks down, so Gold Digger and a couple of dudes push it for 20 miles. When they ask for money, Gold Digger shocks them with electricity. Gold Digger then shocks a cop and then incinerates his ticket book. Nobody cares. There are no consequences in this movie. Pants tries to impress some kind of Texan investor, but his brother, cousin, who doesn't speak English and is basically in this movie to do wild physical comedy shenanigans, causes him to lose out on a sale. The Texan then moseys on over to John Reese davies and they're immediately in business. It's that kind of movie. Then there's some nonsense with the cousin brother chasing down the limo that the Texan is in, falling into an excrement-covered sewer, escaping said sewer, getting run over by the limo, and falling into the sewer again. Then Joe Pantoliano also falls into the sewer. By chance, the fence for the stolen MacGuffin wanders into Joe's store and launches Joey Pants on the main thrust of this movie. A little Scooby-Doo adjacent mystery involving stolen art, forgeries, and gold. Davies and Pants almost come to blows in Davies' much nicer looking shop after Pants accuses him of trafficking in stolen and forged art. A cop is also here investigating stolen art and breaks up the fight. Now the son shows up because this is a kid's movie and we need a kid, I guess. He's, as kid actors go, pretty decent. I'm polished, but he has that New York kid actor vibe that's a little more grounded than Joe Pantoliano's wild shouting and gesticulating. I have no notes for him. He's a little professional and he gets the extremely thankless job done. The power gets shut off at the antique shop because the dad is a certified loser. They're pursuing another get-rich-quick scheme by going after the $2 million reward for that missing statue from earlier. Not the gold mask from the beginning, mind you. Another unrelated statue. They sneak into John Rhys Davies' basement with one of the 
wildest plot contrivances I have ever heard in a movie like this. When your grandpa was still alive, Alex, he told me that there was a secret door to Eli's basement. Let's find that door. The kid has spy equipment for some reason. Maybe the same reason Macaulay Culkin had that talk boy in Home Alone, I guess. Overhears the criminals plotting crimes, and this sends Joey Pants out on an expedition to a doctor who specializes in plaster casts and artwork reproductions. Like you do. This doctor is played by yet another too high profile for this kind of project actor, Peter Maloney, who is in stuff like The Thing and Requiem for a Dream. What was this production paying? How did this first time no-name director get these actors? Usually a movie like this would be filled with TV people and up-and-coming naive performers, but he got a trifecta of honest to Bob acting professionals for the big roles. Like this isn't performative shock here, I am genuinely baffled by this. If I could find the answer to this question, I'd probably sleep better at night. Somehow this segment of the movie almost plays. The people in weirdly contorted plaster casts are a source of easy physical comedy, and the whole setup really gives off a Little Shop of Horrors dentist vibe with none of the grace or poise of Frank Oz. Maloney is giving a level of gravitas here that is unearned but kind of welcome. He's dialed in with his head down and refusing to submit to the goofiness of Joe Pantoliano's Tom Selleck mustached caricature. Are you familiar with the sacred helmet of Sullivan the Magnus? Of course you are. It's recently captain started the Holy War. The blood which will be shed over this helmet will make it one of the most valuable artifacts in the history of the world. This excites me very much. Okay, I spoke too soon on that one. Dude loves helmets? The Doc is in league with John Rhys Davies and discovers Pants' deception. From there we get some throwaway Nancy Drew business with the kid and then... The piece de resistance, the masterpiece of this film, the one item of genuine oddity that feels like it could have been the seed for an entirely different film. I present it in its entirety. Canini. Oh, Dan. Michelangelo. Oh, play hand. You are my prince of plaster. I think this is your best foot job yet. Wake up. You're a piece of art. This scene is so perfectly, beautifully wrong, so out of place in the kid's movie it belongs to, so creepily sexual, so genuinely funny. It's the one spark of life in this film and for some reason it revolves around a giant foot fetish. Pants follows a lead to an Asian bathhouse. It features the same grace and cultural sensitivity we've come to expect from this film. This is the highest paid scene in the film. Maloney, Davies, and Pantoliano are as sweaty as the premise. Pants tries to remain undercover by putting a towel over his head and doing some extremely racist babbling in fake Chinese. It all devolves into a chase scene with a lot of guys in bath towels. Robot in the family. This movie is called Robot in the Family, by the way. We get the thugs from earlier searching a pier in drag. This is not explained well. They make a transphobic crack about union workers and get confused about which crate they need to steal in order to further the art heist plot. It's the next day now. We get a brief glimmer of potential when the dad tries to program Gold Digger to make breakfast. This is the promise of the premise. You call a movie Robot in the Family, I want to see the robot make some eggs or like clean the house or something. Give me domestic robot hijinks. I demand domestic hijinks. But no, the kid wants to do more Hardy Boys nonsense. But for a brief, manic moment, we have our Robot in the Family movie. 
He's making breakfast. He's electrocuting himself with a toaster. He's making pizza for breakfast. He's pouring rat poison onto spam and microwaving the portable television. It's nonsensical. It's a lot of weird, incoherent babbling. And it's perfect. This is the movie, Jack. This is the thing that's on the box. A bunch of kids hanging off the timekeeper's beefy cousin. I do not care about your professional rivalry. I do not care about antiques. I want to see the walking refrigerator make microchip cookies. Also, for some reason, Catcher in the Rye pops out of the toaster. The art critic in me wants to see that as commentary. The Muppet in me knows it's just a pun. Don't call mommy yet, kid. We want this to be a surprise for her. The mom wants the robot out, though. She's got a knife. The cops have been called. This is a tense situation, which calls for Joey Pants to do a pratfall on the slippery floor. And just like that, the moment is gone. We're back to the father-son art mystery. My hopes dashed. My dreams shattered. My robot no longer in the family. Speaking of which, John Reese davies attempts to murder the robot with a garden hose after the bumbling goons deliver the wrong statue to him. The events are not connected, but they certainly happen at the same time. Pants and Son, that's their group name now and you can't convince me otherwise, discover Gold Digger in a sorry state, revive him with some kind of giant capacitor, and head off to the art auction for some kind of art auction shenanigans. But for some reason, Gold Digger is on his own, wandering the streets of New York City. He runs into a Japanese guy selling little plastic electronic robots and he... He immediately starts shouting about Godzilla and runs away in terror. Where are you going? Do you have to go to the bathroom? I will watch your little friends for you. Of course. But on the bright side, apparently those little toys were sentient because now they view Gold Digger as their master and follow him religiously. Sometimes we can have nice things as a treat. But alas, back to the auction. A bidding war breaks out between our heroes and our villains. The auctioneer is baffled because it's a reproduction, but both parties know that there's something valuable hidden inside the statue, so it gets crazy high. Standard movie auction stuff. We intercut this with Gold Digger interacting with even more caricatures and stereotypes. We have an Orthodox Jewish guy, a Hare Krishna guy, and a blind guy, and a cop all getting into a weird altercation. Oddly enough, the blind man is played by the director, and when he speaks, you can start to get the sense of where Joey Pants was coming from when he built his accent for the film. Somebody please help me! Somebody please help me! Hi, 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 hi. Oh, 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 oh. A mugger tries to rough up our director, but Gold Digger does the cartoon electrocution thing to the thug, complete with puff of smoke and post-shock giant hair. From there, uh, I don't know how to say this, so I'm just gonna show it. I wish I could see you! Thank Your you. wish is great, blind man. Uh-oh, I detect danger. I told him to stay away from the solar car. Goodbye! Oh, Have a nice oh day. My eyes! My face! What happened to me? Oh, oh I can't see! 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 Ah! These little toy robots are bloodthirsty. It's like a miniature maximum overdrive down there. There's another perfectly good movie, Jack. They help Gold Digger rough up that same traffic cop from the beginning of the movie. They have little guns now. I need to know absolutely everything about these little gremlins. But instead of diving deep into the terrifying new religion of these sentient toys, we're back in the auction. Parallel cutting is usually used to compress or extend time, or to show two differentiated but eventually intersecting pieces of plot. This does neither. The intercutting here only really serves as an admission of guilt to the audience. We know you don't care about the auction scene, so we added more robot hijinks in the middle to keep you from gnawing your own foot off in frustration. The kid uses the capacitor battery to give people terrifying looking electric shocks, and they pay an exorbitant price for this potentially worthless statue. Real uncut gems vibes. This guy's a problem. Work in the shop, sell your antiques, pay your bills. Because if you don't, people are gonna show up to your house and threaten your family. Oh wait, that's exactly what happens! A couple of goons start to terrorize Pants' wife 
and other kids, and he knows absolutely nothing about this. He's an incompetent father, a bad husband, and an all-around scummy dude. And yet, here he is, our supposedly lovable hero, running towards a truck as it goes speeding away with the statue he just paid over a hundred grand for. John Rhys Davies has some hijinks in the solar car, the wife is terrorized some more by the goons, and Gold Digger randomly wanders by a little girl who is definitely voiced by an adult woman. I shot my dog. Could you fix him? And he fixes her robotic puppy toy. Gold Digger wanders through some more tableaus of New York street life, all of them unspeakably broad, and manages to get himself arrested. This brings up some interesting metaphysical questions. Can you charge an artificial life form with a crime? How culpable is he if he's only following his programming? Naturally, none of these nuances are explored, as we instead get a heart-to-heart -heart with Pants and his son. We get excruciatingly close to the father finally coming to the realization that this whole endeavor has been disastrous for his family and himself, but his son is a little enabler and pulls him back in. A quick aside to check on the family being held hostage, and then we return to Gold Digger as he makes his way down a grim checklist of offending every single protected group in this country like he's going to have a Netflix special called Triggered or Uncancelable coming out in a couple of months. The action moves to a gold foundry where all of the storylines finally converge. Pants gets trapped on some chains over a pit of molten gold, Rhys Davies shows up with the statue, the goons are there to collect money from the plaster foot fetish doctor, and Gold Digger is tirelessly making his way to the finale while the sun waits in the van outside the foundry watching for the statue. Our heroes all wind up dangling around the same gold pit. How could this possibly have happened? I don't want to worry you, but uh, the temperature of molten gold is 860 degrees. You should look very nice plated. <laughs> if you kill me, I will do you. Oh, right. Everybody in this movie is a weapons grade moron. We learn that John Rhys Davies had the mask from Mecca stolen so we could foment religious warfare in the Middle East and profit off of arms sales, and Gold Digger ends up saving the day by shocking the baddies and making them fall into a vat of plaster. Unfortunately, the fake statue seems empty, no gold, everybody's sad. The bad guys get wheeled away as hardened plaster versions of themselves, and I gotta admit, that got a chuckle out of me. I'm a sucker for Home Alone-style villain battle scars. Anyway, the next day, a guy from the bank who looks a hell of a lot like Angus Scrim from the Phantasm movies comes to the door to foreclose in the house, just in time for Gold Digger to drop the head of the statue he was keeping with him to discover the mask from the beginning of the movie. And apparently there was a $50 million reward for its return, so at the end of the day, the dad's invention did in fact make them millionaires. Maybe the structure of this movie isn't as bad as I thought, or maybe this movie has finally won. It beat me down to the point where I'm finally willing to accept it on its own terms. When interviewed about why he made Robot in the Family, Jack Shaul had this to say. The main reason for me to make Robot in the Family was that I wanted to share with the people of the world my warm and happy life. I wanted to say to the people who come to America, you can be successful and happy if you work hard, love your family, have strong morals, and hope. I put all that into Robot in the Family, humor, my background, knowledge, and talent for creating a robot. A robot who has a soul and love for his family and others. A robot I would want to solve problems helping Jack his father and creator to protect his family. I wanted people to imagine that one day a robot like Gold Digger would be created to help them with all their problems. Did he succeed at showing people a rosy future where a robot like Gold Digger could help solve your problems? Absolutely not. But on that other front, that whole American dream front, maybe he succeeded just a little. Not at making a film that reflects that dream in a positive way, but certainly one that reflects it in an accurate way. The American dream is a sort of luck-based lottery. Inadvertently, Shaul created a film where an immigrant is beaten down by the expectations of American life. His desperate drive to keep up appearances leads to him overextending himself and his finances to the point of ruin. He floats on loans and various lines of credit. He's constantly juggling bills and shutoff notices. He's a gambling addict, not on horses or poker or football, but on success. It's the dream turned nightmare. He believes that all it takes in America to succeed is hard work, determination, and good character. But what saves his family at the end of this film? Happenstance. Blind luck. This isn't a movie about a clever inventor having a great idea and changing the world. It's a hastily constructed Rube Goldberg machine that results in a struggling family winning what amounts to a $50 million Powerball. 
And that's the American dream, isn't it? The hope that by luck, one day you will be plucked from desperation and delivered deservingly into the lap of luxury. But it's not a sustainable model. Not everybody is going to strike it rich, deserving or otherwise. Robot in the Family shows the sheer lengths someone will go to in order to make that dream a reality, both in front of and behind the camera. And for that reason alone, it's positively fascinating. Is it worth watching? Yes. But only so I can know that others have suffered as I have suffered. I've brought the family-friendly version of the tape from the ring into my house, and now I pass it on to you. My curse is lifted. Yours has just begun. Thank you all for watching Too Many Tapes. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell icon to get updates for when I upload videos. If you feel like watching Robot and the Family in full, I believe I have the best available version on YouTube on my second channel. Give it a watch. If you want to help out a small YouTube creator, consider donating a dollar or more to my Patreon. I spend every penny I get from Patreon on this show, literally not an exaggeration. Every single penny goes towards making this show look as good as I can make it, and I really appreciate all of your generous donations over the last few years. I know it's rough out there, and you could spend your money on literally anything else. It genuinely warms my heart to know that people out there like what I do and want me to keep doing it. A little vulnerable there, not very funny, sorry about that. If you donate 20 or more dollars a month, you are an A-list actor trapped in a Z-list movie, and you get to have your name in the credits in an enormous font like NATO Kitsch. You can also be like Mippa and have your name in an enormous font too. For $10 or more a month, you're my army of somehow sentient plastic robot toys, and your name gets to be pretty big in the credits too. And for $5 a month, you're Gold Digger, because you're going to change the world, and you get early access to my videos. Thank you all again for watching. And I'll see you next time on Too Many Tapes. Shut up and sit down. Well, boys and ghouls, in Robot in the Family, it won't progress the... It won't progress the... It won't progress the teleprompter, and so I can't read any further! This is deeply frustrating. <laughs>